Okay, we're gonna give this a go. Um, had some problems getting these videos uploaded recently, but uh, I think most things have been figured out. We'll keep them short, uh, as we've been doing, 20 minutes or 25 minutes long. So today I'm going to uh, explain a little bit more of chapter three going into the 17th century. And uh, the last video we do this week before the midterm exam, we'll just be basically talking about uh, the very end of the 17th century, uh, a little bit about Scotland, and a little bit about uh, two extremely famous, important uh, English people, John Locke and Sir Isaac Newton. But for today, today um, you're gonna have to bear with me again, because um, <clears throat> this is sort of going to be um, follow, follow the arrows uh, kind of diagram. So I know it would be ideal. Um, maybe some people would like to see a map of how things look, but I never found that the English Civil War really helps because it's the battles are here and there. Um, sometimes, you know, one side has an advantage uh, in the middle and London is largely part of the parliamentarians, but um, it's not like there's a fixed line uh, with one side on, on, the, on the right and the other side on the left. It's really like a patchwork of um, people who are loyal to the king and people who think the king needs to be, um, if not removed, then his powers need to be limited and he needs to be reined in. So let me explain how this comes about without uh, getting myself off the screen too much. So we've talked about <clears throat> how Henry VIII's Reformation created a big you know, mess of different versions of the Christian church in the United Kingdom, which is not the United Kingdom yet. It's Ireland, Scotland. Uh, Wales is sort of integrated into England. But Scotland, Scotland has its own church, which is Presbyterian, which is a lot more like the radical Protestants. Um, there's Catholics still everywhere, but they are now underground. The last chance they really had to get the power back was when uh, Queen Mary was queen um, and she died um, prematurely and she, her policy was very brutal. Um, so it, it didn't really encourage people, um, didn't persuade people very effectively especially because uh, a lot of the church land is now owned by Protestant, um, wealthy Protestant um, peers and upper class, you know, gentlemen. So Charles, he has a chronic money problem. We talked about this. Queen Elizabeth had to be very clever um, and had to manage her household very carefully um, and borrowed money too. She had her privateers, she had her monopolies. Um, she did whatever she could and she still, you know, um, ended up um, increasing the debt of, of her royal expenditure of the government. Um, however, James, King James, her nephew, when he came down from Scotland, we talked about it. Scotland is a much poorer country. He was king in Scotland for um, almost two decades before he came down uh, and became the king of England as well. He's James the sixth of Scotland and James the first of England. When he comes down, um, he doesn't really take care of his budget properly. And he, because he likes the Anglican church, uh, he wants the church of, of the Scottish to be like the Anglican church, but the Scot church of Scotland doesn't want any interest in that. They don't want to have uh, bishops. They don't want to have the king interfering in religious business. So, ironically, the Scottish king likes the English church better, and he wishes that the Scottish would just join the, the English church. They don't. James lets it go. Um, long story short, James doesn't like war. Um, he's, he fancies himself some sort of you know, peacemaker amongst kingdoms in, in Europe, which that is good for, for um, the budget, for the cost. But um, it doesn't make you, I mean, it doesn't make you um, politically intimidating. It doesn't make you powerful. 
um, or influential um, with other kingdoms when you, you're not a military, you're not a strong military kingdom. And he, they weren't. King James didn't have a big army, he didn't have a big navy. Um, and then he died. <clears throat> um, his older son also passed away, so Charles uh, became Charles I. The problem was is that Charles was one of those plus one people. You know how I said there's finance problems, there's religious problems, there's a problem of local and central control, these five sort of areas that are causing problems in English society and English culture. Um, he is not sensitive to any of them. He just wants to rule um, as an absolute king. He wants everybody to just do what he says and that his executive power shouldn't be questioned. Um, he thinks he should be voted the money and when he needs an army to do something, um, it's parliament's responsibility to give him the men, the equipment and the money. However, um, as you have noticed, from Henry VIII to Edward to Mary, to Queen Elizabeth to James to Charles, the power of the parliament has been increasing, not decreasing. So they're not about to just give Charles whatever he wants, especially a, a, a lot of money to make an army, because they're worried that he's going to use the army against them. So whenever he wants to do something, they give him some money, but not enough to really um, lock down or control the country or, or turn it into some sort of absolute monarchy where um, he has enough soldiers and enough money to, to force everybody to do what he wants. So there's this, while he's, he's young, there's this constant tension, and we don't need to go into it too, in, into too much depth, but, but for years and years, he summons a parliament, they argue, he asks them for money and an army, they say, okay, if we do this, then you have to give us this, and he says, absolutely not, and he sends them home. It goes back and forth until there's a deadlock where um, basically the, the parliamentarians are accusing Charles of taking money illegally. And he's, get, he's collecting tax without permission of parliament. And parliament is saying, you, if you want to tax the people, you have to get the approval. This goes right back to Magna Carta. You can't just walk around and take money from whoever you want. Emergency money is one thing if the country's under attack. There's special emergency funds that you can tap, but you can't just say every year I need money for the military. That's a tax, right? Uh, an emergency thing where, um, you know, the French army is on English soil and they're about to attack London means that the king can get the money he needs because they're going to have a special, um, you know, there's going to be a, sp a special avenue or a special option or a special condition where that happens. But what he's doing is using all these old laws that the king could use to get money from people, charging people for, um, you know, charging people for their rank, um, their title, right? Like basically saying, well, if, if you want to be a duke, then you owe a certain amount every year. Um, we need money for ships in order to protect ourselves and, and to build a navy. So you need, if you make this much money, then you have to pay ship money. And um, the courts and the judges basically decide that what he's doing is taxing and that is illegal. Um, so he's losing the case. Um, some of his friends, some of his, um, some of his um, staff, uh, his ministers are very unpopular because they're using a lot of money and they're not listening to the parliaments. They're just, you know, the king's entourage. So they're getting a lot of privileges. Um, and he's, King Charles is, I would say, not the smartest politician. He's ignoring the fact that the representatives of the country that have the power and the money are getting more and more frustrated and he's ignoring them more and more. It's just, it's like a boiling pot. So it gets to the point where the mood in London, they end up having a vote um, whether they're going to suspend Parliament or not, and they vote that they're, they're not going to suspend it, and that they're going to keep meeting despite the fact that the King wants them to go home. 
So it's the king's um, responsibility to summon parliament and dismiss it. But parliament's decided that they're not going to listen to the king anymore. The vote is about half and half. But what happens basically is all the ones that are royalists, they leave London. And Charles' family leaves London because it's starting to get a little bit dangerous. Like people are thinking about attacking the king. So he goes, of course, to the most royalist place you can go in England, goes to Oxford, raises his standard, and as soon as he does that, he's declared war on the parliamentarians. So um, they raise armies, they have battles all over England. Essentially, the parliamentarians, they have London, they have more money, and they have more people. And so if it's a short war, and the royalists fight really well, it's possible that they'll win, but it's very unlikely, just like other wars, like in World War II, you know, um, you know, Germany um, attacked uh, at the beginning of World War II and took over all of Europe, but then they ended up fighting against the Soviet Union, um, United Kingdom, and um, the United States at the same time. And they, they're just, they didn't have the the um, economic or industrial or military power um, to fight against those three countries. They were outgunned, outnumbered, and and over time, it was, it was only a matter of time until they lost. Similarly, Japan fought against the United States in, in the Pacific, and the industrial capacity of the United States was about 20 times uh, higher than than the Japanese. So. That was the reason the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, is because they needed to defeat the, the Americans as fast as possible, because in the long run, they were going to lose. It's a similar situation here. Parliament has control of London, they have control of the ports, they have control of the money, the mints, the resources. The Royalists have some experienced soldiers. Um, a lot of them are, really believe that they're fighting for the king and they're fighting for the kingdom. Um, so it goes back and forth, but the parliamentarians come out on top, and then the king escapes, and then they capture him again, which leads Oliver Cromwell, and the, actually the supreme commander, his name is um, Thomas Fairfax, but I leave him out because he's a, much, he's a very reasonable person, and although he was a very important military leader, he really doesn't he stays out of the politics, and once you see the politics, you'll understand why. Oliver Cromwell was a fanatic uh, Protestant. He was a Puritan in, in, the, in the most extreme sense. Uh, he thought he was chosen by God to strike down uh, heathens and to convert them to true um, Protestant religion and that you know, the, the Pope was the Antichrist. He, he didn't just believe that Catholic religion was, was wrong or different or bad. He thought it was basically a corruption like a, a work of the devil. Um, he had strange dreams and uh, he was an amazing cavalry commander. He's a fanatical fighter, very brave. Um, he was a natural leader. Um, he, he, he won the war and he insisted on executing Charles. This is a full, you know, th this is a full century and a bit before the French Revolution. So this is why I say, um, I said in class that the British aren't like full-blown revolutionary people. Um, even when they have a revolution where they cut the king off, king's head off, they, they're going to regret and they're gonna try and fix it. And then they're, they're gonna sort of let it be and try and forget about it. Um, that doesn't really happen with Americans and French people. Once they, you go that far and have a reign of terror or that you fought a war for independence and you've become a republic, no, 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 more, no more monarchy, no more absolute monarchs, no more constitutional, where the monarchs are gone. So that's probably why our American friends, um, me being Canadian, my American friends are like, what are you still doing with the queen on your money anyway? <clears throat> but Oliver Cromwell, he has this reputation I have to bring to your attention. He, he, had, he fought all over the United Kingdom and in Ireland. And when he was in Ireland, um, he, he was um, genocidal in his behavior. He, 
he believed that um, Irish Catholics were barely human and that they didn't deserve to be treated um, with any any sort of kindness or generosity or honor. Um, so the, the, the damage that he caused directly in battles against Irish rebels and the damage he caused to the Irish, you know, agriculture, infrastructure, families, food production, uh, hundreds of thousands of people died. So he's, Oliver Cromwell is one of the most hated um, historical figures in Ireland. So don't um, forget that, that although I'm putting him into a certain context here, where he is a revolutionary figure, and revolutionary figures tend to have some bad attributes. Let's just, just look at all the revolutionary guys and how um, they took things a little bit too far, and they were very violent men sometimes, and, and although they might have been intelligent, they just, uh, they behaved in a extreme, they had extreme behaviors that often led to um, terrible damage to societies and human beings. So Oliver Cromwell is one of those people. Um, they try to make a parliament, a commonwealth system, which is like, it's, it's sort of like a constitutional monarchy. It's sort of like a republic with no prime minister or no president. It doesn't work because nobody can agree on anything. So Oliver Cromwell ki kicks them all out, makes them do a new election, and then he appoints himself Lord Protector of the Realm, which basically gives him power over the military, um, over the church, over society, over politics. So he becomes the most powerful person, ironically, in, he refuses to be king, but he takes the scepter of the, loyal, of the Lord Protector, which essentially makes him more powerful than any king ever ruled. Perhaps only William the Conqueror would have had the same degree of power as, as uh, Oliver Cromwell did. Luckily though, Oliver Cromwell, just like all our bad leaders, uh, not that he was bad um, for the, the country, but there was, I mean, there was maybe a million deaths on his hands one way or another. Certainly devastated the country like all civil wars do. He ran the country very efficiently, but it was very expensive government and people weren't used to it. When he died, they weren't sure what was gonna happen because he said he wasn't a king. He had a son named Richard, but Richard was not a military guy and wasn't charismatic and wasn't violent and wasn't fanatical. So he sort of tried to become the next Lord Protector and then people were like, no, Richard, I don't think so. And he, was, he said, oh, okay. And um, the military temporary, temporarily took over. Oliver Cromwell's son, Richard, went to the countryside, got a pension and uh, lived a long life without you know, too much stress, I imagine, which is good for him. Um, and then they decided to do the weirdest thing, I always thought, but maybe it's not as weird. Some people may not think of it as weird, and certainly the people at the time were just looking back and saying, actually, it wasn't that bad. Like, Charles, James, Elizabeth, it couldn't have been that bad. This, what, what's happening right now is much worse. What we need to do is we need to roll things back. We need to put in the institutions and, and get comfortable again, and merry old England needs to be revived. So they literally asked the son of the guy they killed to come back and be king. And he says, yes please, gets on a boat and comes to England to be the king of England and Scotland, remember? Because um, his grandfather is James I and James VI of Scotland. So he's the king of Scotland and the king of England. He also, like James, enjoys his parties and everything. And for a while, everything's fine. Parliament gives him money. They're just happy to be back to where they were, like have a sort of balance and share sovereignty. But something happens. Uh, unfortunately, Charles doesn't have any kids. So he's going to pass uh, the throne to his brother, James II. And for whatever reason, I have no idea how this happened. James II is a very serious Catholic. And like Bloody Mary, he's, he's really set on changing England back into a Catholic country. But 
he's not a crazy, violent, uh, vengeful person like Bloody Mary. So he's not trying to kill anybody. He's just trying to say, Catholic is the better religion. That's why I believe in it. Everybody should be able to see that Catholic religion is better. He's very naive. But everybody's afraid. He has an army and he has money and everybody's afraid that he's going to use it to force everyone to become Catholic, even though that's not true. But in culture and politics and society, half the time it's what you think the person's going to do. That's the scariest part. Like when you imagine who's this, this guy who's going to be president and you're afraid of what he'll do with that power. If he's an unstable person, uh, if he's a devout Catholic and he gets frustrated, is he going to start pointing guns at people and making people go to church? Well, they decide it's too much, it's too dangerous, and these seven guys called the Immortal Seven, they invite James, his, no, no less, James's daughter-in-law and his son-in-law to invade from the Netherlands, which is a safely Protestant country. They sail in 1688, notice, exactly 100 years after the Spanish Armada. They sail over there. James doesn't know what he's doing. He's not paying attention. And quite frankly, he doesn't think that his son, son-in-law, and his daughter are going to do this to him. He's, he's just, I guess he's just, in a sense, naive, but kind of a nice guy. He has his beliefs, and he thinks other people will believe him too. But it's not the case. William desperately wants to fight the French. He needs the English to be on his team. So he comes over and he deposes James II. James II's army melts away. He runs away to, Fran to France to Louis XIV's court. And William of Orange and his wife, Mary, become co-rulers of England. They fight the French. They die. Queen Anne is Mary's sister. She also has no children even though she had 15, 15 pregnancies, somehow she never managed to, um, I mean, it's just a different time, you know, hospitals and, and deliveries and stuff. Uh, unfortunately, her husband died before her too. So she, she had a, you know, un, very unhappy experience with trying to raise her children, but she's the last of the Stuarts. And in the 1700s, they, the English finally defeat Louis XIV. They, they unify with Scotland in 1707, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the second lecture. And that brings us to the 18th century where we're gonna, after the midterm, we're gonna switch over to America. But there will be one more video. Like I said, I'm gonna talk about just the end here, about the Glorious Revolution, Queen Anne's War, uh, Louis XIV finally dying in France and changing the balance of power um, in Europe uh, about Scotland and how Scotland joins the Union making, making the Kingdom of the United Kingdom of Great Britain uh, and those two guys that are in the textbook so please read about them John Locke and Isaac Newton okay so we'll do the second one um, I'll try and get it done by tomorrow but if not Wednesday so read this one and finish the chapter in the meantime.